there. My name is Starla McDermott and I am the Development Director with Guiding Light and I want to say welcome to our first ever virtual ministry update. To be honest, I think we all wish that we could be hosting this at Guiding Light with a luncheon like we normally do. Um, but just like you, we all have had to adapt, be a little bit more fluid and um, connect in different ways. So I appreciate that you are joining in to kind of get a update, catch up on what has been going on with the individuals at Guiding Light, staff and volunteers. So I think I'll start with, um, I know that there's been letters that have been sent out and notifications um, on Facebook and on email, but let me just kind of go back, um, go back into March and um, Stuart Ray, our executive director, had been meeting with the board and with Ed Postma, who is our board chair, and um, had been already putting in some new stringent protocols for staff and volunteers and for the clients in the building for Guiding Light um, in regards to the, the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a lot stricter hand washing protocols, uh, new sanitization protocols, um, any new person coming into the building, we were taking um, temperatures, staff, clients, and volunteers were having our temperatures taken twice a day to ensure the wellness of everybody in the building. And we kept that up for a couple weeks. At the same time, Stuart um, met a um, local homeless gentleman who lives in the Heartside neighborhood who asked Stuart, what's going to happen when the homeless start getting the virus? Is there a plan? What's going to happen to us? And uh, because a lot of the homeless live in Heartside or in a very small area, they're congre congregating together. And um, this homeless gentleman named Cecil was concerned about what was going to happen and mentioned that to Stuart when Stuart came upon him in a walk. So Stuart reached out to Ed Postma, who is our board chair, and they reached out to leadership within the city. They reached out to different health organizations, um, other nonprofits, to try to find out if there had been or is there a plan, a coordinated plan, for when, not if, but when homeless would begin to start contacting or contracting um, the COVID-19 virus. And it appeared that they're really, um, they were all kind of like us, like all of a sudden, boom, this, this, this virus hit, and now we all have to start figuring out what we need to do. And um, we're lucky to have leadership that wants to plan ahead and think forward of what we need to do so that we're not just rushing and trying to grab. And so Stuart and the board met, met. there was a lot of prayer of what's the best thing to do um, they continued to have emails and phone conference calls with different leadership to try to find out what would be the best coordinated plan to safely house vulnerable individuals like homeless who may be waiting for testing with COVID-19 or may contract the virus. And it just became very evident that there just wasn't, it's not that there wasn't a coordinated, it was that there just wasn't space to do it. And so then there was a little bit more prayer on our board side, and then it was determined that probably the best thing that we could do was to loan our building, which is located at 255 Division in the Heartside neighborhood, loan our building to the Kent County Health Department. And as soon as that decision was made by the board and with Stuart, our executive director, um, the wheels started turning, uh, paperwork was being done, and we pretty much just said we are offering our building at no charge, we will continue to pay the utilities, the bills uh, in regards to the building, um, but we will loan our building to the Kent County Health Department as an isolation center for individuals um, who are homeless that do not have a place to go to be safe, to be treated or waiting for testing. So that announcement was made on Friday, March 27th, and within one week, we, um, were amazed. <laughs> the clients that stay at Guiding Light really just pitched in and helped us move out of the building. And this is a huge building and the back to work men and the recovery guys all worked together to pack up and put a lot of items into storage, but then also move programming items to new locations. 
So we moved the recovery group, all the men that are in recovery program, we moved them into Iron House, which is our sober living apartment complexes down in Kentwood. And um, the back to work men were given some, a couple different options. And they either, we helped them move in with family that they could stay with, or if they did not have a place that was safe and healthy, we have been housing them in different hotels. Unfortunately, we weren't able to keep them all in one space. Uh, so they are kind of spread at a couple of different hotels. That was mainly because we wanted to keep our men safe. Staff had already been kind of been moved remotely and we just felt the need to continue programming, but do it in a safer way. So recovery men are now at Iron House and back to work are at a couple of different motels. So once we moved out, which was the first week of April, the nurses from Kent County Health Department came and did a tour, determined the best way to um, house everybody with using proper six feet of space. And um, we had a couple of um, industries who donated bedding and they had that building set up as a guiding light isolation center within a week. It was amazing. So they probably did begin to see the first couple of um, homeless individuals with COVID within the second week of April. At this point now, the Kent County Health Department has completely taken over 255 division. Uh, we are doing our programming elsewhere. And so we haven't been privy to every single health detail in regards to the care of the vulnerable that are staying there. We have heard that they have treated about 70 individuals. More than a dozen were waiting um, for testing and then were, came back negative, so they were able to leave. Uh, a few have um, that were confirmed with the COVID-19 virus became severe enough that they did have to be transferred to a hospital. And the majority have been um, sitting at, are resting and getting the medical, medical care that they need in a safe environment at the Guiding Light Isolation Center. This is preventing them from walking around and potentially being with their friends that are also homeless but not infecting them. Uh, a few have been there long enough that they've been able to be released back into the community. We felt that this was the most important thing that we could do. We did not want to see individuals that are in our community not being taken care of. And I have to say though, we could not have done this without the amazing help that our donors did. They stepped up and have really helped us make this transition. The individuals that were at Guiding Light, our clients who are, have been moved elsewhere are doing well. Uh, we continue to um, adhere to stringent protocol in regards to health and keeping everybody safe. Uh, we're not letting them roam around. They are staying at Iron House. They're not running to the grocery store. We are doing special pickups if they need food. They are doing programming via technology and that includes the back to work. There is contact, very minimal in person because we wanna keep everybody safe. So I have to, wanted to invite two individual staff individuals who have been working with these program men closely to kind of share what we, how they have been doing and how they're responding to these changes that have happened. So I want to introduce to you, um, Brian Elvey, who is, a, is our director of the Guiding Light recovery program, and he can share with you a little bit of what the men in recovery have been doing since we had to move out of, or chose to move out of 255 division. So Brian, you know that we had to move all of our gentlemen out of Guiding Light um, so that we could loan the, the building over to the Kent County Health Department. Um, this also um, created some major changes in how we do programming and I thought it'd be good for you to share with our donors um, how things are different and what you guys are doing to still work with the guys that are in recovery. Well, two big parts of our structure are environment and community. So those two have been um, changed and anytime there's change, there's a little resistance, there's a little bit of maybe, I don't know if pesticism is the right word, 
but we, we have a struggle changing. So we get used to one way of doing things and then it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're changing all this up. Like it, it feels really uncomfortable, which really fits into what real life's all about. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we need to go through something like this to help men kind of see what change looks like, but we have taken all of our recovery men downtown and put them in the housing called Iron House over in Kentwood. And we are doing all of our classes, all of our one-on-one -on -one counseling, coaching um, through Arbor Circle, through our staff, via um, technology. And of course, that brings up kind of like uncomfortableness on both parts, staff and the men. But our biggest concern, our biggest thing we're addressing is the safety of the men. And that comes from our leadership. I think, you know, we know that. So we are trying to reiterate that it's not only their safety, but how they treat themselves can affect other people. Right. So it's, we are never fully like each day, there's a little bit of a shift, like a change, um, not so much in the safety procedures, but just kind of the news we get and what's going on in the world. And we're like, okay, we can only work with what we can control which really fits again into kind of like how we want to teach the men about change. So yeah, there's a lot going on. How are, do you get a sense of how they're feeling? Are mm -hmm. they um, re responding well or is there some stress? Well, the neat part was they had a big responsibility in getting the building vacated uh, through moving furniture for the, for the health department through, um, I think everything's pretty much cleared out. Um, and they played a role and they felt very empowered by that. Like they were actually contributing, which is one of the things we talk about. How can I contribute today to, to community? Right. And they really took that very personally. And so they get out to Iron House, which is more of a, it's not maybe country to you and I, but it's country compared to, to the brick and mortar of, of 255 South Division. So there was a lot of excitement kind of like, uh, what's this going to look like? I can hear birds, I can see, you know, fish and all that stuff. And um, now that it's kind of settled in with some of the, you know, restrictions, um, as far as either from the state or from how we want to approach the men's safety, I think they feel in a general, the general community feels like some fear because they don't know what's going to happen. Right either program wise like does this mean like it's going to change some of the programming like how we do things with getting work and where they can work and how we go about that and again not knowing is another thing we kind of teach to that there's a lot of things we just don't know right so right. it kind of match we're, we're trying as a staff to kind of show how this kind of matches up with with things we talk about um but they're feeling there is some anxiety there is some fear and you know some days are easier for, for, for others, but overall, I think it's really made this group pretty cohesive. So they're still meeting via Zoom with spiritual directors, mm -hmm. correct? And mm -hmm. then um, how are they getting um, some other faith um, empowerment, church and th things like that? So they do, they do um, Lexio Divina, which is basically a scripture reading um, and kind of go through that together as a group. They do centering prayer on Friday still with a, um, it's led by someone through Zoom. Um, they also bring in church services on Sunday morning and we give them a couple different options to Zoom in certain churches, you know. Um, so those are three. And then obviously, you know, the support groups for people in recovery are also, you know, consider themselves spiritual programs. So I think they're, they're getting their, they're getting their usual dose. It's just coming at them a little bit differently. Yeah. Well, that just shows that we all have to adjust to this change, not just our men, but the community in general. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I would like to mention to donors that if anybody wants to pray for the men or to send them some well wishes, feel free to make a comment on Facebook and um, you can pray for them, but you can also wish them some good luck. Is there anything else that Brian that you want to share or feel that um, might be helpful for the, for the men? Well, we have in total around 37 men either working and living in Iron House, either been laid off in working and living at Iron House or in the kind of program of Guiding Light Recovery. 
I have been so pleasantly surprised on how they've come together as a community, even with the social distancing, the things I've mentioned previously. I, they keep telling me that they feel so kind of grateful to be in this position. And I think that goes back to the donors. And I think this is the first time we've had an, obviously an event like this that I know of. And they, they are just, they're just grateful. So, you know, thank you to our donors. Thank you to those people that contribute. Um, th there's just so many cool stories coming out of this, along with so many scary stories and, and you know, heartfelt tragedies. Um, I can't tell those people that continue to donate. Thank you so much for, for, the, for the help you're giving these men. It, 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 it's changing their lives. So thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Brian, for sharing with us. I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, without it, I wouldn't have the chance to grow into the person that I want to become. Um, we are all truly blessed to have you guys in our lives. I just wanted to thank you for everything that you're giving us. I know it would have been like really easy for you to just kick us out and um, and have us like come back in two months or whatever, but it's really a blessing that you're allowing us to continue our journey in sobriety over here. And uh, I really can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your support and all your help throughout this entire phase of our lives. It's been a little bit crazy, but without you guys, I don't think we would have anywhere to go. And it's really awesome and really touching that you guys support us so much in our recovery. And I just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to introduce to you Michael Koss. Michael Koss is a case manager with the Back to Work program, and he has had a lot of one-on-one -on -one contact with the men in our Back to Work program since we had moved out of the building at 225 Division. Um, I think one of the first questions that most don donors might want to ask you, Michael, is um, I guess number one is how are the guys doing? But um, maybe start with um, where they had to go when we made the decision to, for safety reasons and health reasons, to move them out of Heartside. Well, we gave um, the gentlemen that were in the program at the time um, the option of finding their own housing um, if they knew family members or uh, friends in the area to, uh, uh, that they could shelter in place with. Um, and then the people that didn't, um, then we have, we had to find uh, housing for them. And that pretty much uh, was local hotels and motels. And it sounded like we weren't able to find hotels in the same location. So they are kind of spread around, around Grand that, Rapids then. That is correct. Okay. And um, so we're staying in contact with these gentlemen. Um, it sounds like um, you're doing it via phone, Zoom, and in person. So why don't you share a little bit of the process to keep in um, contact with them and showing support? Yeah, um, so I meet with them uh, via the phone fairly regularly, um, every week, a couple times a week. Um, then I am meeting with them as necessary to provide um, payments for the motel rooms that they're in and uh, deliver food and or also um, uh, gift cards uh, to local places uh, such as uh, smaller, smaller places. I, we don't wanna go to the big box stores where there's a lot of people. Um, so we've been providing uh, gift cards, uh, Aldi's and um, uh, the Dollar Tree. Okay, that's perfect, actually. And I did see some great photos um, of the gentleman when you were delivering Easter meals to everybody. So you're also yeah. doing it very safely. Everybody's wearing their face masks. Right. And, um, and so that food was provided by donors, and we're very grateful for that. And then the continuation of providing the food and the gift cards and also the housing um, has been provided by our donors. And to keep this going for the long haul, we don't know how long this will last. That's going to be very key. Um, how are they feeling? Um, you know, most of them are scared. Uh, they, most of them are unemployed. There are a few that, um, that work in medical supply manufacturing that have maintained their jobs, which is very good. Uh, the gentlemen that can't find jobs right now are being encouraged 
by me um, to go out and still, or at least make phone calls and emails to still look for jobs because there are uh, jobs available out there. There's still some out there. So we're, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to promote that as much as possible. Um, and uh, yeah. Well, and you're saying thing. also, um, cause I know that the, some of the men had opted to move into homes with family or friends. Yes. And you're still also staying in contact with them, though. So we're not yes, just I dropping am. the ball. We're, we're trying to oh. show as much support as we can. Yeah, and that, that is true. And it sounds like also alumni, people who have been in our Back to Work program, you're still have some contact, checking in, making sure that right. you know, that happens. Yeah, we're still continuing that part of the case management, uh, still checking in with them. Um, between myself and Dwight Lee, um, Another um, employee of the Back to Work program, we are uh, reaching out to the alumni as well. Perfect, perfect. Well, tell the guys that we are um, thinking of them and praying for them. Um, again, I know that I said this earlier about the, the recovery program. If any donors want to wish the men in the Back to Work some well wishes or anything, um, you can post that on our Facebook, um, but also please keep them in their prayers. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Michael. You bet. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to all of our donors who have um, tuned in for our first ever virtual ministry update. And um, I want to thank you for all the continued support that you have done for the men that have been in programming and also for the individuals who are currently staying at the Guiding Light Isolation Center who have been either waiting on testing or have been tested positive with the COVID. We know that all of you are dealing with the situation as well, that there's this COVID-19 pandemic is impacting you personally. And so we realize that um, with you dealing with that, you still have concern for the men in our program, you have concern for guiding light, and you have concern for these individuals who are homeless, who have been sick. And for you to be so selfless and to care for these men and to support us is very kind. We have a donor officers who normally are out visiting with you, but because of this isolation at home, they have been working from home and calling and talking to about 200 donors average a week. And they've had a lot of good feedback from you, um, our donor officers, Brad, Steve, and Bob. And so I asked um, Reverend Bob Evans to join me today and kind of share some comments that he has been hearing when he's been calling the donors to say thank you. So I wanted to introduce Reverend Bob Evans. And Bob, what are some of the comments that you've been hearing from donors as you make thank you calls? Well, Starla, like you said, we've, we've been on the phone a lot uh, since we really can't visit because of the pandemic. And the basic idea behind the phone calls is that we, we're checking up on people, we're saying thank you, and whenever it's, uh, it's necessary, we're educate. And, and as a general rule, We've done a good job keep, keeping people informed about what we do. Of course, the pandemic has changed everything, so a lot of people are concerned about uh, how our clients are doing, the ones we, uh, we generally take care of. And then uh, they've heard something about our relationship with uh, Kent County and how we've let them use our building as a place for um, the homeless to recover from the, from the uh, virus. And uh, so those, that, that's basically the feedback is they're, they're grateful that our guys are doing well. They're grateful we're doing what we're doing. And they're also uh, quite grateful for the fact that we've involved ourselves in the recovery from the virus for the homeless men and women. And that just shows how wonderful our donors are to um, be living in this. And we know that everybody's being affected by it, either by economy or by health. And to still show the concern for people in their community is great. Is there any really great, cool stories um, that you can share as you are talking to the donors? I know there was one. It was great. Well, there's a lot of them, but one of my favorite was I, I made a call and, and the, the lady of the house answered the phone and I, I believe she was trying to work from home as well as educate her children. And I could hear in her voice that she had kind of reached the end of her rope. And, and so I said, well, what are you teaching them right now? And she said, well, my kids go to a school where the Bible is part of the curriculum. And I'm about to teach them the story of uh, the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace from Daniel chapter three. And I, just for fun, I said, well, you know, I know that story. Why don't you let me tell it to them? She said, oh, good. I'm so glad you came along. So she put me on speaker and I gave a five minute discussion of the story for the kids. And I, I asked them questions and things like that. So, uh, 
we try to respond to the donors as well as we possibly can. That's that's just so great. So it just and again, I that brings back to I want to say thank you to our donors um, because you all are, have stressful times and you're still showing the care and concern for um, the men and again for also the individuals that are at the isolation center. I um, I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Bob. I want to thank all of you for tuning in today for our first ever virtual ministry update and um, say thank you for the support that you have given. I also wanted to make a really um, nice announcement. We had a local uh, foundation, the B Item Foundation, who has offered a $15,000 grant. And um, with that grant is a stipulation of raising another 15. So if we can raise $15,000 on our end, they will match that up to $15,000. So today, I want to do an ask out to you if you can find some kindness in your heart. Um, if you want to give online to this virtual ministry update and to the individuals that are um, we're helping, you can donate at www.guidinglightworks.org forward slash give, and your gift will be matched by the B Item of Foundation. So thank you very much for all of you for chiming in or turning in. And um, Bob, would you be willing to give us a closing prayer? Certainly, should we bow our heads and pray? Lord, we wanna thank you today for the work of Guiding Light. On a regular basis, we are humbled by your work uh, that you allow us to do and the people who support our work. But today we are especially humbled as we've been able to maintain the ministry of re-engagement in the midst of the pandemic. So Father, today we are thankful for uh, God-directed leadership for faithful staff, for men who are willing to work toward a better way of life, and a host of wonderful people who freely give of their time, talent, and treasure so that the men we serve can have another chance at fully being all you created them to be. Thank you, God, for your wisdom and your provision. Amen. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for your support.